Uh, thanks, Eric. Thanks, Jeff. So we'll just get going. We'll start with the first session is on the business of arthroplasty, uh, and we'll have Dr. Huddleston uh, start us off. Thanks, Nader, and good morning, everyone. This subject uh, usually gets put first or last for a reason, so I'll get all of the uh, really morbid stuff out of the way first, and then we can enjoy the rest of the day. All right, so I'm going to uh, tell you sort of what's going on in Washington, and uh, I'm sure Dr. Barber, who's given this uh, qu lecture before, is, is glad he's not having to do that anymore. Uh, so these are my disclosures. Uh, none of these are relevant uh, financially to what I'm talking about. Um, I have served as the advocacy council uh, chair for um, American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, which is where I learned most of this alphabet soup. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the current state of healthcare funds flow, um, just to do some level setting. And um, I will uh, then talk about the principal care management codes. And uh, those are the codes that we are using to uh, cover our pre-optimization work that's being done um, and to offset uh, the cuts that we had in 2021 uh, for primary hip and knee replacement RVUs. And fortunately, those are getting paid, which is great news. Um, and then uh, I'll uh, just uh, raise awareness about uh, this uh, new uh, total joint arthroplasty patient reported outcome performance measure. Uh, that has arrived and uh, is uh, going to uh, cause your hospital to incur uh, hefty fines if you're not on board with it. And uh, we just had uh, the AOS uh, annual fall meeting combined with the uh, NOLC in Washington last week, and I was there and I was telling you what we were advocating for. Uh, so just to level set, uh, these are some data from Nate Heckman, um, and this is uh, basically showing the Medicare fee schedule for primary hip and knee replacement for surgeon reimbursement. And um, you can see here that uh, it continues to go down, and uh, the estimate is uh, now, uh, as an orthopedic surgeon, you uh, would get paid more money to see patients in the office than you would to, do, to operate. Um, so that's uh, really, really sad. Uh, so why is that the case? Well, where's all the money going? And um, this is a big part of it. So here's uh, growth in hospital administrators. Uh, and you can see from 1970 to 2015, it's seen exponential growth in orange there. In green are the physicians, haven't grown a whole lot. And if you ask the administrators about this, they say the system is so complex that they uh, need more technology uh, and there's more regulations that they have to deal with, so they need more people. So you'd also expect that there'd be a lot more people being taken care of uh, to justify this, but uh, unfortunately that's not the case. So how about their salaries? So th these are data that are, are readily available. So uh, from economic research, the average hospital administrator salary is 382,000 across the United States. Uh, that's $184 an hour. Uh, if you take care of a Medicare patient uh, in the office, do the hip or knee replacement, and take care of them for 90 days, on average, you're gonna be being paid about $64 an hour, okay? So what's worse is that uh, if you look at the amount of schooling they've had, 54% uh, of them have a master's and only 4% of them have a doctorate. So if you take a conservative estimate that uh, medical school is, is, is twice as rigorous in terms of volume of information covered than any other education, uh, and residency is, is four times as rigorous as any other education based on an 80-hour work week. Uh, with the four years of medical school and the five years of residency and one year of fellowship, that's 10 years, you, you're probably putting in 30-fold uh, compared to any person who has a master's uh, in terms of the education and the investment that you've made to be able to be a physician. And in the Bay Area, as an expensive place, the, the salaries are even higher, $464,000 on average. Um, so the growing wage gap is a big problem. These are a little bit older data, but this is uh, from Randall Marcus, 2005 to 2015, and he looked at 22 U.S. academic medical centers. And you can see during this 10-year period, the uh, hospital CEO pay increased 93%, orthopedists pay increased 26%, pediatricians 15%, nurses 3%. And uh, unfortunately, none of this is justified by any increase in utilization of healthcare services. 
So uh, on the left is really just the ratios of uh, different folks' pay uh, increases, and you can see the CEOs top the list, but the graph in the middle is uh, ED visits and inpatient visits and outpatient visits over the 10 years and not really much of an increase. And then uh, on the right is the, uh, the pie and how it's sliced up. So the orange is total health care expenditures. At the bottom is physicians. Uh, and then the next two highest groups are non-physicians and non-clinical non-physicians. Uh, so not a whole lot of growth uh, for us, but a lot of growth for uh, the hospital administration in terms of how much they're getting paid and where the dollars are going. And these are also readily available data, so this is the other major stakeholder. Uh, here are the insurance companies. So. Um, you can see their profits are going up handsomely. So this is uh, from 2020, but in 2020 they made $16 uh, billion more than they had the previous year to get up to about $176 billion of profit. That's profit, not revenue. All right, so this is one of the things we were advocating for was to get a simple update for inflation. Uh, to the conversion factor. So the conversion factor is what CMS uh, uses to determine how much they're going to pay us for a relative value unit. And uh, the green would be what the conversion factor would be uh, worth if it was adjusted for inflation. Uh, but unfortunately, what we have is the yellow uh, there where it basically, basically has remained flat. So while inflation has increased, how much we're getting paid per RVU has stayed exactly the same. Uh, and uh, despite the fact that our actual fee schedule or what the physician gets paid uh, is somewhere between 6 and 9 percent of the total episode of care spend, uh, they continue to uh, cut us, uh, which really has uh, minimal influence on the total spend, yet hospitals and insurance companies get paid more. So well, why are they able to do this after many, many years of advocacy and many trips to the Hill and pretty well uh, informed? and well-planned uh, plans. Um, and part of the reason is, is that we, in general, make a lot of money. And uh, hospitals are the largest employers in their district. So if you go to a congressman and you start telling them to pay the hospital less, they're going to say, well, this is the biggest employer. And it's a hospital. They, they know what they're doing. And they're always doing the right thing. Why would we want to pay you rich, greedy doctors more money? And uh, lobbying is very important. So. When we had a reevaluation um, from about 2018 to 2020 for uh, RVUs for primary hip and knee replacement, I spent a lot of time in Washington, and uh, it was uh, perhaps the most discouraging thing for me of many discouraging things that I saw is uh, we have very well-paid lobbyists for American Association Hip and Knee Surgeons who do a really good job. We would be going into a high-level meeting with a CMS uh, official or even at the White House, and uh, as we were going in for the meeting, the group that had the meeting before us were coming out, and uh, our lobbyists slash lawyers would be high-fiving the lawyers coming out, and they were representing the uh, insurance companies. And we'd have our meeting, and we would go out, and as we were going out, our lobbyists would be high-fiving the next group of lawyers coming in, and they're representing the hospitals. So it's all just a big game for them, but it's very discouraging. But this is what we're up against, but our dollars do matter, so we, we do have outstanding PAC contribution relatively compared to other specialties. We're second behind anesthesiology. Um, but it's important that we contribute to that, whether you think you uh, make a difference or not. And then this is perhaps the most important thing. At the end of the day, they know that we like our jobs and we would choose to do it again, and that's why we're an easy target. So um, last week we had a meeting with Senator Barrasso, who is from Wyoming, who is a Republican, retired orthopedic surgeon. And um, I've known him for about 12 years now, and uh, he's a real good guy. When the rubber hits the road, he actually does uh, whatever we ask him to do. And he's very well informed on our issues. But um, I think we were his last meeting of the day, and last week was probably the worst week to be in Washington uh, because everybody was uh, um, consumed with trying to keep the government open. So they didn't really want to uh, hear from a bunch of doctors in monogram. Uh, shirts and cufflinks about uh, uh, why they should be getting paid more. But he basically said, look, you, you, if you want us to pay you more, you need to figure out where the money's going to come from. And saying that it should come from the other stakeholders who are absorbing the funds seems to fall on deaf ears, deaf ears unfortunately. Uh, but he, he said, you know, it's, it's hard. You, don't, you guys aren't high up on the list. We have other people that we're prioritizing. And you're the 10th group of doctors that I've met with today. One of them was the urologist. And there's a lot of guys in the Senate who have prostate problems. So they have uh, our ears as well. So that's unfortunately what we're up against. 
All right, so that's the doom and gloom. So uh, we are getting paid a little bit more for these principal care management codes. So you can use this now to um, basically cover the time that you, uh, your nurse practitioner or PA, and um, office staff are spending on trying to coordinate the care, i.e. optimizing the patient before the operation, which we've done a really good job uh, with. And both CMS and private payers are now paying this. So just to let you know what it is. So it's for treatment of uh, beneficiaries with a single serious chronic condition, osteoarthritis meets that. And then um, the diagnosis has to last between uh, three months and a year until the death. They have to have uh, hospitalization. They don't have to spend the night, but they have to go to the hospital. And uh, whatever is gonna happen places the patient at a significant risk of uh, morbidity and mortality, um, which certainly what we do does. So we, we meet the requirements for that. And this is non-face-to-face -face time. So this is you calling uh, or somebody in your staff calling the cardiologist um, or the pulmonologist or the anesthesiologist to make sure all of our ducks in a row and the patient has the green light to have an operation. Um, and uh, the time accumulates through a month, so uh, you get to do it once per month. And uh, once you get to 30 minutes, you can do the code. Um, and uh, in uh, AMA slash CPT speak, uh, there are what they call QHPs or qualified health professionals. So that's one schedule. And then your office staff uh, is on another schedule. So uh, these are the two codes, 99424 and 99425. Um, and uh, the first 30 minutes and the second 30 minutes are what are covered here. But it can be you, your PA, or your NP. And then the office staff has basically the same uh, time frame and the same requirements. But uh, there's no uh, reason that you can't uh, put in um, a code for the staff and a code uh, for uh, your QHP uh, for the same patient. And, uh, you know, this is a pretty small bone in terms of what we're actually getting for it. So for the first 30 minutes for QHPs, it's 1.45 RVUs. Um, and if you recall, when we got our, our recent haircut on RVUs in 2020, we went from 20.72 to 19.6. So this more than makes up for it. Um, and for uh, the second 30 minutes, you get uh, one RVU. And then for the uh, um, office staff, it's one RVU for the first 30 minutes and 0.71 for the second. Uh, 30 minutes. So this requires another note and uh, putting in a code and more clicks. So it is a hassle and it would have been nice if they just rolled this up into our um, uh, overall physician fee schedule RVUs, but they didn't want to do that. So that's what we get. And uh, um, I'm sure not all private payers are paying for it, but I haven't heard of anybody actually getting denied. And this is from multiple areas in the country. Uh, and CMS is certainly paying for it. So and you know, we, we had to jump through lots of hoops over many years to get this enacted. And uh, other groups have done similar things for other reasons. And then CMS turns around and doesn't pay it. So the fact that they're paying it is great. All right, so I just want to go on now to uh, TJA, uh, Patient Reported Outcome Performance Measure, which is already uh, uh, in full swing. And uh, the rubber hits is going to hit the road here in April of 2024 when real dollars are going to start to change hands. So just by way of review. So macro was meant to replace uh, the sustainable growth formula, which uh, basically ended up with the dog fix every December right around uh, the end of the year. And we're actually now back to that based on the various cuts that we face. And uh, when they finally do the budget at the end of the year, they usually uh, reverse or defer them. So uh, this unfortunately hasn't been very successful, but it did create the quality payment program. And the two sides of that are an advanced alternative payment model or MIPS and uh, APMs would be like comprehensive care for joint replacement and BPCI and BPCIA. Unfortunately, they have not been very successful in terms of the overall spend. So uh, MIPS is getting more interest. This is a, uh, a systematic review from Health Affairs looking at the impact of bundled payments on a variety of specialties. And uh, for hip and knee replacement, uh, based on CJR, the, the savings was only 1.6%. So pretty modest. Uh, and um, they are looking for ways to improve that, which I'll touch on at the end. So here's the PRO performance measure. Um, so we're in uh, at the end of year two. So the first year, they, uh, uh, first and second years are voluntary. And um, in the first year, if you submitted any PROs to CMS, you uh, got credit for it, and they uh, announced that publicly. The second year, you got credit for it publicly, but they also reported the percentages of PROs that you were reporting. And then uh, starting on uh, April 2nd, 2024, this is now mandatory, uh, and um, the penalty is pretty hefty. So 
this is uh, what it is. So the uh, PROs that you have to collect are either Hoos or Coos Jr., depending on whether it's a hip or knee replacement, and then a general health measure promise uh, global or VR12. And uh, you need to show that you have a preoperative uh, survey, which is within 90 days of the operation. And then uh, the post-op window is between 300 and 425 days post-op. And uh, the PRO has to be linked for you to get full credit. So it's only three months out of the year. So it's April to June 2024, uh, with the corresponding follow-up uh, a year later. And the threshold that they've said is uh, you have to have 50% of all uh, of your patients' uh, Medicare fee-for-service have PROs during this time period. And uh, if you don't, you're going to lose 25% of what they call your annual payment update. So this is how much more money uh, CMS plans to give the hospital every year, uh, and it usually varies between 2 and 4%. Uh, so if it's 4%, this 25% this haircut is 1%, is and it, it's not just Medicare fee-for-service for hip and knee replacement, it's the, all of the hospital's Medicare fee-for-service patients. So it's a big, uh, big penalty, millions of dollars for large institutions. And if you don't meet this part uh, of the uh, QPP, uh, you are disqualified as a hospital from participating in any of CMS's value-based programs uh, for that year, which is even more of a haircut. So this is a big deal. You still have some time to uh, help your hospital realize the importance of uh, having them facilitate you collect uh, and utilize PROs, but um, you better get on it. So the uh, Academy is really trying to shine a light on this, and uh, I'm part of this uh, patient reported outcome uh, work group, uh, which has turned out to be quite a bit of work, and I, I want to thank Kevin Bozick for that opportunity. But um, the first thing we did was to um, send a survey to our members to sort of see where they were in terms of what they thought about PROs and then um, uh, whether they were collecting them and perhaps more importantly whether they were utilizing them. And uh, I'll, this will be published in uh, Journal of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons shortly, but uh, here with uh, what we found from the survey, and we, we didn't get a, a robust response. I think we only had like uh, 650 responses, but it's better than nothing. So, you know, over half of the members said they thought that uh, proms were important, and younger candidates, uh, uh, younger members, and people at academic centers were more likely to embrace this, uh, as you'd expect. And uh, only 46% of uh, Academy members at the time of the survey in uh, this past April were collecting proms, and just about a third were actually utilizing them in their practice to counsel patients. Um, and the top barriers to adopting proms were not any surprise, so staffing burdens and patient challenges. Um, and um, most of the folks who were collecting proms had an EMR, whether it was at an academic center or a private practice, 95 and 75 percent. Um, and interestingly, if you asked folks whether they would collect these uh, in a perfect world, uh, only 80 percent said they would. So, uh, and these are the same data in graphic form uh, showing the importance. So half the people thought they were important, and then uh, about half are actually collecting them, and only about a third are utilizing them. And so uh, the general orthopedic surgeons uh, and uh, hand surgeons were less likely to view PROMS as very important. And then uh, those in academic uh, teaching and research uh, settings were significantly more likely to say that PROMS were important. That's not a surprise because they've been collecting them for a long time. And then, uh, as you'd expect, uh, adult recon surgeons are leading the pack in terms of both collection and utilization of PROMS. Shoulder and elbow is a close second. Um, and uh, as I said, the rates are higher for academic centers, which is not a surprise, but this now affects everybody. So, all right, so I'll, I'll leave you with what we um, were advocating for last week uh, in Washington, and uh, the uh, Academy actually passed a resolution uh, with a unanimous vote defining their number one advocacy priority as Medicare payment reform. Uh, so that's uh, a big step and will help sort of concentrate our efforts. Um, and so the first point we were asking for is a simple uh, update to inflation. I showed you where we are with that, getting killed, and um, they're not really uh, listening. But anyways, um, that is what our first our priority is. So this graph shows you basically current versus 2023 20, uh, real dollar reimbursement for total knee arthroplasty. So it's going flat, uh, not looking at inflation, and it's going down exponentially looking at inflammation. Uh, inflation since 1992. All right, so these are some of the cuts. Uh, most of you are aware of these, but you know, in 2021 we had a 5.4% cut to our RVU uh, rate. 
the Medicare sequester is if uh, Medicare as a program spends more than a certain amount of money, they automatically take 2% back for everybody. Uh, so that's always at play and uh, it's been deferred. Um, and then uh, the conversion factor, 3% cut, uh, got some relief by postponing it for a year. That's coming back at us. Uh, the 5% uh, bonus payment that you got if you went into an advanced alternative payment model like CJR, BPCI, instead of MIPS, uh, that's uh, getting taken away in January. And uh, the new E&M e codes uh, uh, filed by G codes, which is a 2% cut, is going into effect January. And then the geographic practice cost index floor in, uh, uh, is going away in January as well. So there, there's lots of things. So there's um, the Strengthening Medicare for Patient and Providers Act, which is essentially advocating for inflationary update. Uh, I would not be optimistic this is going to go anywhere. So I'm sure um, a uh, very uh, arduous part of our practices for most people is going to be dealing with prior authorization reform. This, in my opinion, is totally out of control. Uh, the average practice has more than one uh, FTE spending an entire uh, uh, career doing this. So th this is, in my opinion, absolutely absurd. Uh, and uh, if I have to spend my time talking to another pediatrician, I think I may retire. Um, but anyways, we have their ear, fortunately. So this got some traction last year. Uh, and then it, didn't, it got out of the House, and then it didn't get out of the Senate uh, because they didn't have any way to pay for it. Uh, and uh, the Medicare Advantage plans say, oh, it's going to uh, lead to a 300% utilization uh, increase in services right away, which they have no data to support and is a complete lie. Um, but anyways, uh, the uh, congressmen and women who are doctors uh, actually went around um, the, the lawmaking process and went to the rulemaking process. So it, it is uh, in a rule now that there will be some reform, but this is a pretty watered down reform. So it's really just uh, saying this needs to be an electronic system so we can capture sort of what the denial rates are. But um, implementing a, a sort of gold card program is promising. Uh, they have done this in Texas and unfortunately hasn't been very successful because the insurance companies aren't, aren't uh, uh, cooperating. I can uh, go into more detail about that with you offline if you want. But uh, So there are two different uh, uh, new bills that we're trying to get through uh, and we'll see where they go. But most folks are not optimistic this is going to get done at a federal level. It probably has to be done at a state level. And then uh, we also were advocating for increased uh, penalties for violence against providers. As I'm sure most people in the room are aware, there's been two orthopedic surgeons who have been murdered in their office by patients over the last 18 months. So this is a big topic. And um, uh, Jay knows we get a lot of emails at AUKUS about uh, patients being, or providers being very concerned about this, understandably so. And then the last two NLC uh, points were we're always uh, advocating to repeal the ban on specialty-owned hospitals. Uh, and we're also arguing for a single uh, site payment, uh, regardless of where the patient gets operated on, whether they're an inpatient, hospital, outpatient, uh, or ASC. So w what can you all do to help? So learn the game, uh, write letters uh, to Congress uh, and to state government when you get uh, simple asks to do this through the academy and AUKUS. And uh, take some time to establish relationship with members of Congress and the state government. They actually want to hear from you and they're pretty responsive. They can't always get anything done, but they are responsive. And then other things that can be done to help our plight is uh, condition-based bundles are uh, what's coming down the pike very quickly. Uh, they're still sort of working out the details of how uh, specialists can be nested in an accountable care organization. This is being done uh, by private payers, but CMS is going to be doing it soon. And then lastly, uh, population health, where you as the physician are involved in an entity which assumes some risk for caring of the patient over a defined time period uh, may be uh, uh, the best way to go. Uh, and there are various um, iterations of this. Managed care uh, uh, was originally what it was, and then now we have Medicare Advantage, and over 50% uh, of all Medicare beneficiaries are in a Medicare Advantage plan. So Medicare Advantage plans are making money hand over fist. So this is where most of the money is going now, but this is an option for physicians if they're so inclined. So in summary, I'll tell you that the principal care management codes are getting paid. Um, it's a little bit of a hassle to write another note and to make a few more clicks to submit the charge, but uh, it does uh, add up at the end of the year. And uh, there's a, definitely a burning platform to, for you to get your patient reported outcome measure house in order very quickly, given that real money is going to start changing hands on April 2nd. 
uh, and then AOS and AUKUS are advocating uh, for Medicare payment reform and will continue to do so. And condition-based bundles are going to be here quite uh, uh, soon and uh, population health may help uh, improve value as well, but uh, that's going to be harder to get off the ground. Thanks very much. Thanks so much for this very sobering start off talk. Uh, Dr. Ward will give us our next talk about digital tools uh, to aid our practice of Prepiro collection. Hopefully this will help us get to that number. All right. So uh, again, thanks for, thanks for that update. I appreciate all of your hard efforts on our behalf for that, because I know it's, uh, I know it's uh, uh, you know, it's hot and sticky in Washington in the summer uh, multiple, for multiple reasons. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, digital tools to, to aid your practice. Some of this will be relevant for patient-reported outcome measures. Um, and I'm also going to kind of go through just some of the options that we have in kind of digital adoption. So these are my disclosures. Um, UCSF does contract with certain digital partners. I don't have personal disclosures, but I have more knowledge of those partners and sp uh, specifically. My other disclosures, honestly, Dr. Beeney should probably be giving this talk, but he already had too many talks to give here, so I kind of took it over. Um, but I modeled it a lot based on uh, 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 some papers he's written anyway, so um, he'll have much more knowledge of the details of a lot of these things. So we talk a little bit about digital adoption in our profession uh, in general and sort of the uh, enthusiasm that has developed over digital health. I'm going to go through sort of a whirlwind tool, uh, uh, tour of the types of digital tools you can add to your practice. Um, I'm not going to talk specifically about uh, particular tools as much, both because of uh, uh, conflict of interest as well as because there's simply too many to talk about. Um, but I will go through sort of a, a framework you, you may be able to use to adopt some of these tools. Uh, so uh, digital adoption is growing. The AMA ha has uh, every three years now, uh, over the past kind of uh, seven years uh, or nine years, uh, put out a survey of uh, 1,300 physicians, 50% uh, of whom are specialists, um, looking at sort of digital adoption, digital enthusiasm. And uh, every year, the percentage of physicians who feel that digital tools are worthwhile goes up, as well as the number of digital tools used in practice rises. So on average now, people are using about four different digital tools in their practice. Um, if you looked at that like 15 years ago, it was less than one. So um, you know, it is a, a fairly, a fairly uh, prominent rise in, uh, in these applications. And that's important for our practice, both because of the potential advantage they have for us, but also because of the cost. So kind of a summary of the survey trends is that people are more enthusiastic about it. They're adopting things more frequently, um, and they have plans to adopt things uh, more in the future. Um, the other uh, key takeaway from this survey was that um, the pandemic really accelerated the adoption of digital health tools uh, by sort of you know, pushing telehealth and that kind of laid a framework for other digital adoptions. So again, the largest growth in, in digital tools remains in, tele, uh, in remote care and, and telehealth. Uh, this is true in orthopedics as well as uh, primary care and other subspecialty practices, and for obvious reasons because of the pandemic. Um, I think the most important part of this adoption was actually the rapid um, takedown in barriers to payment that happened during the pandemic. Um, the, uh, it was really, really hard for people to adopt telehealth in a meaningful way when it wasn't getting paid for, but during the pandemic that, that accelerated and so people were able to adopt it really quickly, both out of necessity and because they got paid. Other things that are gaining traction really are remote monitoring. Um, this is, may become more relevant in arthroplasty, but it's particularly relevant for primary care. Um, and then some things that are pretty interesting are sort of consumer access to clinical data. Patients are you know, getting better access to their own data, both through notes and their outcome measures, um, and patient engagement platforms are also rising pretty significantly. One of the, um, you know, when, when people or when physicians are asked sort of what are the most important things to them, uh, what remains the most important thing is that the digital tool actually improves the outcome of the, of the patient care. Um, the second most important is that it improves efficiency. So if you look at a digital tool and it can do those two things, then you generally have something that's probably going to work pretty well for you. 
In terms of the requirements to adopt these digital tools, the two most important are that it has some, some sort of evidence that shows that it is either superior to or equal to traditional care or a traditional model of care. And most importantly is that it's well integrated with the electronic health record. The microphone gets on. Listen. Right. All right. Um, and that's a really critical part of it because uh, when, you, uh, when you start to adopt these digital tools in your practice, you, you need to ask the questions about the adoption beforehand. You don't want to look to adopt a digital tool and then realize it's never going to integrate with your electronic medical record and then it's uh, basically a waste of time. So let's talk just briefly about uh, telehealth, again, rapid adoption due to the pandemic. It actually has very, very high patient satisfaction. In general, patients really love telehealth. However, it tends to have mixed satisfaction from providers. The, uh, there's a high interest in adoption among orthopedic surgeons. It turns out that it's actually fairly cost effective to the healthcare system, even when you account for the cost of the technology itself. And then there's a number of trials in orthopedics that now show, uh, and in arthroplasty, that now show that it's not necessarily inferior to the standard care. Um, and this includes things like uh, outcome measures, patient satisfaction, complication rates, um, and even surgical bookends. So there was a randomized control trial that showed that patients book, or, um, a, uh, surgeons booked just as many surgeries from clinic over telehealth visits as they did from in-person visit. However, there are some challenges, right? There is a technology cost in adoption. Sometimes this can be actually cost negative in the first couple of years. Um, and so you need to sort of carefully weigh this. You can't perform a physical exam. Um, and so there are, there are both some you know, decision-making concerns about this as well as some liability concerns. You can't get new x-rays quickly. So if you think a patient you know, was seeing you for a hip and all of a sudden they're complaining about knee pain, you can't just send them down the hall for a knee x-ray. And then there's a different type of medical legal exposure for, uh, for telehealth than there is for an in-person visit. Again, that's partially related to the uh, physical exam, but it's also related to, um, to the privacy of the uh, platform itself. Now, it is reimbursed. Um, it's actually reimbursed uh, in many states commensurate to a level for a regular visit. However, this is state by state. Um, and the uh, uh, JBGS put out a nice review article in this forum uh, sort of that gives you some resources where you can actually look at and make sure that you are coding this correctly for your particular state and how to do that. You know. But there's problems and challenges, right? Like this can be a huge pain in the butt. You know, it's, you can spend 20 minutes trying to get the patient just to log in and unclick their own mute button. You know, you definitely want to have your, uh, your, your, you don't want to, you want to have your camera off if you're going to be picking your nose um, or going to the bathroom like this person. Um, and so you just, you know, we all, and we all experience Zoom fatigue, right? Like, you know, for a while during the pandemic when all the visits were telehealth, at the end of the day, it was just, you kind of wanted to bang your head against the wall. So, um, you know, it's certainly not the end all and be all in orthopedics. And I personally think that when you're face to face with a patient, you do develop a different relationship with them that is, uh, you know, perhaps more meaningful um, and, you know, establishes a different kind of trust. You know. Well, let's talk about a little bit about digital and virtual scribes. I still think it's it's somewhat hysterical that we have to adopt a 15th century technology to make a 21st, 21st century technology actually work. Um, but I guess you know all the money in the EMR is actually going to the uh, you know the Epic headquarters uh, where they have like you know ping like all sorts of weird uh, like slides that connect the different floors and all this kind of stuff. If you ever visit their headquarters, it's wild. Um, so there was, again, a big shift during the pandemic to digital and virtual scribes, uh, uh, largely, um, uh, you know, largely out of necessity. There's now a lot of companies that do this. Um, they both, many of the companies offer both synchronous and asynchronous platforms. And the productivity requirements in terms of making this cost neutral are actually not terrible. Now, they are actually the most for orthopedic surgery and then for any other specialty. But it's you know two or three more patients a day, and you actually make the scribe program cost neutral. Um, and if you look at sort of provider satisfaction and provider time spent on notes, that's probably a worthwhile endeavor. Um, there have been a lot of challenges for a lot of healthcare institutions adopting this. Um, UCSF has had its own particular challenges, and so a very, very small percentage of UCSF physicians actually have scribes, even though it's been shown to improve provider and, uh, satisfaction and increase productivity. 
But I also think this is probably the, the tool that is the most ripe for, uh, for advancement in digital health uh, in the short term with the improvements in uh, AI and natural language processing. So I think fairly soon we're actually going to see some digital scribes that do not involve a person at all and will actually write the notes pretty well. So hopefully this, uh, this will be coming to all of our practices in, in the near term and will actually make our lives a little bit easier. And then also hopefully connect to our coding and billing. Um, another thing that's getting a lot of attention these days is virtual physical therapy and telerehabilitation. There's now a number of studies out there that show that it's not only feasible, but has non-inferior outcomes. However, I would say that one of the caveats when you read all of these studies is that these are self-selecting patients. So these are patients who are willing to go into a study that includes telehealth or, and telephysical therapy. And so, you know, I'm a little cautious about adopting uh, sort of that non-inferior outcome uh, metric. Now, it can be cost-effective, but not all the studies show that it is. Some studies show that this is actually not necessarily a, uh, a savings uh, for the healthcare systems overall. Uh, it really depends on the cost of the platform itself. But I also think that this really, again, sort of begs the question of whether or not physical therapy is necessary for a lot of our patients. I think for many of our hip patients, we've shown pretty clearly that it's not. And for, I think, a number of knee patients, it's probably not as well. And so uh, I think we do need to do a deeper dive, you know, again, into physical therapy as we're getting hit with more cost issues and see if whether or not this is actually worthwhile at all. Um, something that uh, has sort of a mixed bag, but uh, may be helpful for you in your practice, depending on how busy it is and your different... Um, in your particular setting is the surgery uh, clinical and scheduling applications. Um, so certain systems are really, really good at this in terms of clinic visits and those kinds of things. Uh, Kaiser has a really easy program where the patient can schedule clinic visits. You know, that works really well for, for a Kaiser system, may not work as well for you where you want a particular type of patient mix within your clinic um, and different kind of sort of a different balance of new and follow-up visits. The, uh, the promise of these applications is that they'll help increase utilization, decrease cancellations, um, and allow you to move your surgery uh, schedule around with ease. That'll ease the burden on your staff in terms of doing this. And that eventually you can use some real-time real uh, real data to drive scheduling for uh, maximum efficiency. Um, and there's some kind of fun studies that look at this. Uh, this particular one looked at sort of surgeon predictors of their uh, OR time versus machine learning. And they were able to use this algorithm to basically show the surgeons that they were really bad at predicting their OR times. And then use it then to dump into a scheduling system to sort of improve the scheduling so that the surgery schedule wasn't over or under scheduled as much. Remote monitoring, um, this got a lot of attention a couple of years ago. That attention has kind of like decreased, um, you know, Fitbit, Apple Watches, the iPhone, all those kinds of things. In primary care, this is actually growing pretty exponentially as sort of blood pressure, remote monitoring, and, you know, vital signs remote monitoring and heart rates are, are becoming a really important part of uh, primary care remote monitoring. But in arthroplasty, it's not so clear. There was a, a number of papers kind of out about this that shows that these are certainly feasible things. Um, where you can put a sensor on a patient, you can check their range of motion, you can check their, their step count, they can actually check like how much force they're putting on their, their knee or their hip as they go through recovery period or go through physical therapy. I think some interesting points about this are that uh, some studies showed that patients were much more engaged in their physical therapy and recovery when they were being monitored, right? So if like someone's watching you, you're going to do your exercises. You know, if you go to the gym and someone's watching you, you're going to like lift a little bit harder, or, like run a little bit faster. Um, and so that's probably true for patients if they think that you're watching, even if you're not. Um, you know, they may actually work a little bit harder, do a little bit better, and they may have a better outcome, but that's not really, not really shown clearly to be the case. So I think we need more data on this in terms of, of how it will actually improve outcomes. There is some billing potential for remote monitoring, but again, it requires another note. Um, and one of the real questions is if we're going to be remote monitoring people in the global period, you know, it may not get reimbursed at all, though Hutch might have some more information on that. So it may not be worth sort of adding a bunch of documentation burden in the period we care about the most, because if it's not going to get paid anyways. And I'd also be a little bit cautious about what some of the studies say. So this was, a, this was actually a pretty interesting study that looked at a very simple uh, remote wearable sensor that showed like force and range of motion. Um, it was pretty easy for patients to wear. Um, but in their conclusion, they said that this novel platform uh, has been designed to easily incorporate in the routine clinical pathway in a low maintenance and low cost manner that is acceptable to patients. Well, this is the sensor. 
I don't know what low cost is to you, but 1600 bucks a sensor is not really low cost to, to me. So, you know, I think we have to be a little bit cautious about how much these things actually do cost and then what happens with the data. Um, as Hutch mentioned, patient-reported outcomes are uh, now uh, you know are are upon us um, as a mandate um, and really important. There's a lot of companies in this space, um, and they all have uh, slightly different offerings. But I think for most practices, this is probably something that people will have to do is to partner with a company that does this for you. Collecting your own patient-reported outcome measures is is incredibly time ineffective. Um, and unless you have an organization where you can create your own platform, it's really not going to be worth it. So partnering with a company is going to be important. There are huge challenges in connecting to the, daily, to the electronic medical record. Uh, and so a company that's well-versed in that is going to be uh, very, very helpful. Um, and I also think this is a, a particular place where it really highlights sort of the disparities in digital health. So this is a study that looked at uh, patient-reported outcome measures by race. Um, and really showed a, a pretty striking disparity in terms of, of uh, what we're collecting. But um, it's, uh, this is probably, you know, for the arthroplasty world, the most important space uh, in digital health to explore if you have uh, not explored it yet. Um, another thing that gains a lot of attention recently is online reputation management. You know, I, I think people talk about this a lot, partially because it sort of hits a nerve when you get a bad review. Um, and there's sort of a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of um, there's a lot of noise in this space, and um, you know I would sort of say when reading about this, I would kind of say ignore the noise. There are there's really no evidence that uh, that um, uh, that you need to pay someone to manage your online reputation. Um, I think that still the most effective way to manage your reputation is to take good care of patients. The only studies that we have really show that word of mouth uh, tends to still be the most important. However, online reviews do seem to matter. Um, 80 to 90% of patients actually go online and check out their doctor now before they see them. Um, and so the most, and, and unfortunately, the most important review websites that they see are not websites that we have really any uh, control over. So... Um, the review websites that are incredibly popular with patients include things like Health Grades, Vitals, RateMDs, Yelp, and Google. Unfortunately, they are rife with inaccurate information. Um, I think according to Health Grades, I work in Southern California. On RateMDs, I work for Sutter. Um, you know, and unfortunately, unless you sort of claim your profile, do the work, and get them to change it, um, it it's, it's pretty inaccurate. There's also some questionable validity of reviews. There was a lawsuit in Texas a couple years ago where a patient had basically uh, was mad at an, uh, at an orthodontist um, and they basically went and created a bunch of fake reviews online um, pretending to be different patients to try to like, you know, lambast that doctor. The review website did nothing to, to deal with that even when the, the doctor re reported it. And the doctor actually had to sue in uh, in in you know uh, had to had to file a lawsuit against the patient and the review website in order to get them taken down. Um, unfortunately, these do require some monitoring to manage. So if you have a group where you have an administrative assistant who can kind of go on these websites and check out reviews and make sure that there isn't something that's really kind of crazy or out of line there, that's okay. And if also the onus is entirely on the physicians. The review websites take no legal liability for anything that's done, done online. Um, and we have kind of no protections in this space. So how do you manage it? Well, you certainly can hire a company to manage it for you. However, that may not truly be necessary. But one way to manage your online reputation is that you can use a patient engagement platform that helps you generate positive reviews, right? So there's a number of digital health companies that have a patient engagement platform. If the patient says that they like you on the engagement platform and they're sort of rating your service, then it'll automatically dump them to a review website. If they give you one star, then it won't give them the link to the review website. Um, so kind of, you know, art of, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, working to, to encourage the patients who have had a good experience with you to leave reviews will help sort of drown out the, the potentially negative reviews about how bad your parking lot is and how uncomfortable your waiting room chairs are. Um, you do want to actually work to remove um, sort of defamatory reviews. Now, this takes time and effort, but um, the all of the patient review websites do have some kind of uh, some kind of guidelines in terms of what patients can leave. And so if it is, you know, if it includes swear words or is libellous or defamatory, you can often get it taken down, but it takes some effort. 
And one really, really important thing about online review websites is that you need to respect HIPAA. So the AMA has a guideline about responding to online patient reviews, and they say very clearly that you do not want to disclose any information about the patient on a website, even acknowledging that the patient is part of your practice is technically a HIPAA violation. Um, now, if you go to sort of the company review websites that talk about managing this for you, they want they tell you that you want to respond to every review. That That is actually in the incorrect thing to do. That is technically a HIPAA violation. So you really should not engage with any patients on a review platform. Um, however, there are some ways that you can engage with the patient offline. If you if you want to do that, you can you know you can have the practice send them a non scripted message saying, please contact us at this phone number and that kind of stuff. Um, but you really need to be careful of HIPAA. Uh, the government takes this very seriously. The fines are intense and can actually uh, institute legal action. Social media is a big black box for physicians. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who, who post. Um, I was kind of sad that on the, the top 100 social media influences on um, formerly Twitter on X, that does not include Dr. Beanie. Um, you know, really, really shocked to find that, but he's not a sports physician and they kind of dominate. So I guess he's really not posting on Twitter enough. Um, again, on social media, you know, I, I think it's a, if there really isn't a lot of evidence out there as about as to sort of what this does for your practice. Now, I certainly can think it help help you connect to other surgeons, pose interesting research questions, talk about difficult cases and all that kind of stuff. Um, but again, you really need to respect HIPAA. Uh, when I was preparing this talk, I went on LinkedIn to look around and in the first like 20 seconds, I found about six different things that could theoretically be considered HIPAA violations. So if you're gonna post any sort of patient information, including just a, a de-identified X-ray on a social media website, you better make sure that you have that patient's permission in writing for you to do so. Um, otherwise, you are technically committing a HIPAA violation. So even a de-identified X-ray posted on a social media website is a HIPAA violation. Artificial intelligence. I didn't really know what to say about this, so I asked ChatGPT. Yeah. Um, and it actually came up with a pretty good answer. So I'm not going to read this out loud because you can go ask it for yourself. But uh, it was pretty impressive. Um, I think the one thing to say about artificial intelligence is it will touch every space in orthopedic surgery and in digital health. Um, and so I think it, uh, I think there's just going to be, it's so nascent in terms of how it's going to affect us, but there's a lot more to come. So I just want to talk briefly about, so how do we assess these digital tools? How do you decide to adopt a digital tool in your practice? And I, I think, you know, uh, there's a number of different papers that talk about this, but this is kind of the framework that I took away from these papers is, is these six questions. So most important is, does it work? Right. You really want to figure out whether or not this thing actually works, right? Can the patient go on and click through something? Does it connect with your EMR? Does it actually do what it's promised to do? Then does it help your patients? Does it help your staff? And does it help me? And if none of those things are true, then it's probably not worth, not worth adopting. You want to ask, does it help the practice financially? And that can be either directly, um, some kind of billing issue, or indirectly in terms of patient reviews or improving the patient uh, practice reputation. You need to ask about liability. You need to make sure that records are kept, that patient information is protected. You want to ask not just whether or not it's good for uh, a practice in general, but your particular practice. Each practice landscape uh, is a little bit different. And so what one practice adopts is different than another. And then you want to be careful and ask clearly how you're partnering with the company, right? Is this something that you're going to develop together? Is this something simply that you're going to buy? What's the reassessment period and follow-up? What is the company responsible for? What are you responsible for? And so if you can you know, make sure that you can answer all these questions before you actually go and adopt something and sign the dotted line, it'll really help you figure it out. And these are some best practices, I think, that have... Uh, uh, that can help you with digital tools. One is you want to choose tools that can integrate easily with each other. Tools that integrate with your electronic medical record are absolutely critical. If they don't, it's really, really hard to use um, and essentially becomes something that, that sort of sits on a quarter of a desktop and is, is, is not worthwhile. But tools that integrate with each other can be really helpful. So a patient engagement platform that automatically helps you collect your patient reported outcome measures, but then also directs patients to a review website, um, that is a particularly helpful type of tool. 
you want to align your interests with the company, right? So if a company is interested in, you know, if it's a newer company or doing a digital health tool and they want to co-develop something with you, then that's a place where you can align your interest. You want to make sure that the company has or is going to give you the appropriate resources to develop, implement this tool, and you want to make sure that the company is accountable for what they're telling you they're going to do. And then I think another thing that is not necessarily always the case um, in, in sort of the startup culture in the digital health world is that you want to ask for really a long trial period before you sort of make a full purchase, right? So if people say, oh, you know, we'll give you the free version or the freemium version for a couple weeks and then you decide, you say, well, that's really not enough time for me to figure out whether or not this is helpful. You know, it's more like months or even a year before, before sort of you, you end that trial period. For larger healthcare systems, there's a nice paper that was published by Nature Digital Medicine that, that sort of looked at a framework for adopting digital health tools. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but there's sort of a way that they had a nice kind of uh, way to lay out whether or not, you know, how you adopt things and what you talk about, um, both in terms of the return on investment, identifying resources. But I think in conclusion, you know, digital health is, is certainly here to stay and rapidly expanding. I think market competition will increase the usability and value for these companies. Um, and I think we're already seeing that. But I would still use a lot of caution when selecting products. Do your homework because they can be really expensive. And if you develop a framework for your assessment and sort of the reassessment over time of your digital tools, then that can lead you to a lot of success with these companies. However, the opposite is true. If you sort of sign on the dotted line too quickly, then you'll end up just spending money. Oh, all right. Thank you. Gratuitous picture of my time. Thanks, Eric. And uh, our last speaker for this session is Dr. Kamara talking about Medicare Free Fridays. This one not working? Or? Hello? Yeah. All right. So good morning, everyone. My name is Elliot Kamara. I'm coming for you from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx in New York. It's really great to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Jeff and Derek. Love to be back on the West Coast and any excuse to come to California. Uh, my talk, a little bit of an overlap with Dr. Huddleston. I'm going to be talking about Medicare. Hopefully a little bit less of the doom and gloom and a little bit more of why I'm hopeful for the future. That being said, that might be a reflection of the fact that I've only been doing this for about five years compared to some people here who have decades of experience in this realm, and I have nothing to disclose. So the goal of my presentation today is to explain the history behind this chart. These are the raw percentages uh, updated unadjusted for inflation since 2001. Comparing the physician in the purple to the rest of the figures, inpatient, outpatient, hospital, SNF, then compare that to the Medicare Economic Index, which is Medicare's proxy for practice costs, and the Consumer Price Index, which is commonly cited for inflation. Adjusted for inflation and practice costs, Medicare physician pay declined 20% from 2001 to 2021, or about 1.1% per year on average. This is a problem affecting all payers, not just Medicare, because the majority of payers peg their rates to some multiple of Medicare. Therefore, the lack of adjustment in the Medicare physician payments has also contributed to commercial payment decline. This chart shows a negative annual growth for both Medicare and commercial payers. When adjusted for inflation, this is going to be much larger than the 1 to 2 percent that's cited in this paper here. So we can't talk about insurance without talking about the big person in the moon, Medicare, which covers about 60 million adults in the USA, representing 93 percent of the insurance market in patients above the age of 65. So to go back into the history of Medicare, it's a federal program that covers health services for any qualified beneficiary. It was established in 1965, given that a lot of adults back in that time, only half of the nation's seniors had health insurance, and most of that was just for inpatient hospital costs. In 1972, it was expanded over the years to include permanent disabled individuals. Um, generally, people are eligible I see why you switched, Derek. All right. Yeah, I'll just put that there. Generally, people are able uh, to qualify for their coverage if they can't work or if they have a medical condition that's expected to last for one year or more, resulting in uh, disability. 
and it's administered by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, or CMS, which is within the Department of Human Health Services. Um, and then it's also administered by private entities that contract with CMS to provide processing and claims and things like that. The 1965 law also established Medicaid. It consists of four distinct parts. Part A covers the inpatient hospital services, skilled nursing. Um, this is funded by a hospital insurance trust fund, which is through a payroll tax of 2.9% of earnings shared equally between employers and workers. Since 2013, workers with an income of more than 200,000 were hit with an additional tax of 0.9% of their income above those amounts. Part B is what covers our physician services, uh, outpatient services, and some home health aid preventative services. This is funded through beneficiary premier, premiums, which is about 25%. The other 75% is funded through the general federal government. Part C is the private plan option known as Medicare Advantage, which covers Part A and B, um, except for hospice. And this, uh, anyone who enrolls in Part C must enroll in Part B, and it's funded through the same funds. And Part D is our uh, prescription drug benefit program. In the federal budget in 2021, Medicare accounted for about 10% of the federal budget representing $690 billion. If you combine Medicare with Medicaid, they account for about 20% of total federal spending. The benefits uh, uh, spending is expected to increase and projected to double more over the next decade. This consistently puts Medicare as a hot political topic. Uh, even though the program is extremely popular with its constituents, it's consistently in the radar for deficit hawks. So where does all that money go? That's a large pie. About 25% of Medicare benefit spending is for hospital inpatient and outpatient hospital services. Uh, both of those numbers, and 9% goes to physician payments. Both of those numbers are actually a little bit lower because Medicare Advantage, is a, which is the capitated program for Medicare, does cover a little bit of both of those benefits. So to go back into the history, the payments for Medicare was originally based on reasonable costs for hospital services and usual and customary uh, charges for physician services. You can't really understand how we got here and what our options are for the future without knowing the history behind these costs. Uh, in 1972, the program then expanded to allow a capitated program, which allowed private insurances to provide the benefits in exchange for a monthly payment. Then that began to place some limitations of the definitions of what a reasonable cost was and what a usual customer service charge was. So prior to the passage of uh, legislation in 1983, hospitals were reimbursed by, reimbursed by Medicare on a retrospective cost basis. Under this system, the hospitals paid whatever they spent. There was little incentive to control the cost because higher costs brought about higher levels of reimbursement. It was about a cost plus 2% basis for all services. Partially as a result of this system, the hospital costs increased at a much overall higher rate than inflation. Viewing this graph, you can see over 10 years from 72 to 1982, the hospital spending growth per enrollee increased dramatically, while enrollees only increased between 20 to 30 million. So while the CPI, or Consumer Price Index, was increased 89%, hospital costs grew 345%, and this is in the first 10 years of the program. Recognize that the incentives provided by this cost basis reimbursement was uh, a problem. Congress made some changes in 1982, and the DRG was born. Uh, the health services was directed to propose a plan to control these costs, and instead of reimbursing hospitals for the actual cost of patient care, the system pays them at a fixed rate for each admission based on the DRG, and that resulted over 10 years in a 20% savings compared to the prior projections of Part A spending. The DRGs bundle services, labor and non-labor, that are needed to treat a particular disease. It covers most of the operating costs for the hospital and CMS creates a rate of payment based on the average cost to deliver that care. The DRG rates do not include any additional cost to the hospital for direct medical, medical education or any of the physician services covered by Medicare Part B. CMS assigns a unique weight to each DRG, and most of the conditions that are more costly are assigned a higher DRG weight. Now we can spend a lot of time reviewing how facility fees get formed based off of a DRG, and I don't want to get into all the details, but the, the real point of the slide is to put that they are adjusted. They're adjusted annually for labor costs and non-labor costs, capital payments, which reflects insurance costs, there's cost of living adjustments in the wage index, then the hospital gets some more money if they treat a large number of Medicare and Medicaid patients or train residents. 
The main idea here is that to show that the DRG is multiplied by many modifiers that are updated annually to reflect the increase in costs and inflation. Most importantly, all of these updates are done on the regulatory side, on the rules side, meaning CMS sets these rates with inputs from other agencies and they're independent of the legislative process. This means that the costs are placed as a spending in the Congressional Budget Office score each year. So it's not like we're adding ex extra spending and that's what all the politicians are always focused on, the Congressional Budget Office score. So how does this play out practically? Um, looking at total hip arthroplasty and total knee arthroplasty for the 2024 proposed rates, they're proposing a th almost a 3% increase in the payment rates. This was without any sort of real advocacy, lobbying, this is just how the system was set up. Now, we have to contrast that to physician payments. As I said, prior to 1992, physicians were reimbursed on a usual and customary and reasonable charge. Uh, people similar to the hospital payments, the federal government felt that this system perpetuated rising healthcare costs, and they commissioned a study by researchers at Harvard and the AMA to estimate the relative amount of work physicians contribute to the services they render. The study was massive and it was a, it was a nice goal. They basically were trying to capture the current market of healthcare and quantify it through physician surveys and technical data. And there could be, there's an hour long lecture just on their methods alone. Um, it was published in 1988 and it was the basis for the RVU system that was implemented in 1992. It can almost be thought of as the physician DRG. There were three components to the RVU, a practice RVU, a physician work RVU, and professional liability. So when we talk about work RVUs for total hip arthroplasty, you're th talk, thinking about the physician work RVU. So if you're an RVU-based employee, that's the number that you're going to be credited for. Important to note that your collection is going to be based off of all of those numbers, not just the physician RVU. The definition of the physician's work took into account the physician's time, mental effort, judgment, technical skill. The practice expense is what could be thought of as your clinical staff, supplies, and medical equipment. And the professional liability is a much smaller component, what represents your insurance cost. Similar to the DRG, there are some modifiers here, but these modifiers are only uh, for the geographic price index, i.e. the difference between you know, your cost in California versus an urban area and rural area. There's no modifier here for inflation and each of those are multiplied by their own geographic practice cost index. After multiplying each of those by their practice cost index, you get your total work RVU. Then your total RVU is multiplied by the conversion factor, which is part of the legislative process each year. Since 1992, any changes made to this system is through the uh, Relative Value Updated Committee, also known as the RUC, which is an independent group of volunteer physicians. The deliberations are complicated by the fact that the size of the Medicare payment pie is fixed. Medicare B is subject to budget neutrality rules, meaning that a bigger slice for anyone else means that you have to find it from someone else. This basically puts doctors against each other. This is how the system was set up. We're all fighting for the same pie, meaning that if the RUC recommends an increase in rate for arthroplasty, that must cut others, or it risks an overall reduction in the conversion factor affecting everyone. Over the years, the RUC has made recommendations and changes to the RVU system, and arthroplasty of hip and knee have been decreased through this process a few times. Uh, in 2013, the RUC recommended a drop from 23.25, and you see in 2010, to 19.3. Through lobbying, through AUKUS, and through the AOS, this was changed to 20.72. But then, Anthem Insurance reinitiated the review process through the RUC, the Blue Cross Blue Shield, in 2018, and 2021, we dropped back down to 19.3, which was their original recommendation in 2013. So the THA and TK work RVU were decreased by the RUC, so what about the conversion factor? The original legislation in 1989 had a formula, but Congress retained that right to set the conversion factor themselves. Note the dramatic difference in this compared to Part A payments. The conversion factor is always in the news and contentious as a result because it's part of the legislative process. There have been many versions that have come and gone to set the conversion factor, but they've all been flawed and unacceptable to the entire medical community simply because they won't keep up with inflation. If the conversion factor was adjusted for inflation from 1998, uh, it would be $55, but in 2023 it was $33. Uh, in the 1990s, the formula was the Medicare volume performance standard in the 2000s of sustainable growth. And since 2015, we've had these fixed updates as Medicare tries to shift itself to alternative payment models. Also important to hear that whenever you hear about massive federal cuts, like across the board cuts, PAYGO, 
um, any type of budget deal, this is going to in addition, be on top of any conversion factor decreases, so we're often getting a double hit. So where has this all led us today? Uh, CMS proposed a 2024 conversion factor of about $32, which represents a 3.3% cut from 2023. They also did propose a slight increase to the total RVUs uh, for uh, hip and knee arthroplasty, but it was a very small increase. It was due to expen increases in practice expense and malpractice insurance. Uh, it didn't offset the cut completely. It's going to lead to about a 2.8% uh, drop in payments in 2024. So to look at the differences in physician payments and facility fees, the key is the legislative versus the regulatory process. The differences in how the programs were formed, I suspect the complexity also of the GRG calculations versus the straight up simplicity of a conversion factor led to Congress maintaining control of the conversion factor, also limiting the RUC process, forcing physicians to fight against each other by limiting the size of the pie rather than allowing for appropriate inflation uh, adjustments for the size of that pie. If it feels like arthroplasty is consistently in the crosshairs of the cuts, it's because we are the second largest DRG expenditure. Looking at the top 20 in this chart over here, number one is uh, sepsis, and re we're right after that. Uh, so number two, representing about 14% uh, percent of all the DRG payments in the top 20. And right after that, you have vaginal delivery, tracheostomy. The reigning top five are non-elective procedures, so it makes sense that we're constantly in the crosshairs of CMS. But as Dr. Huddleston said, the rising costs are not coming physicians from per capita payment. It's from the rising facility fee. Orange is the physician payment, blue is the rising facility fee. Um, and the surgeon's payment as a function of the total episode of care, as you saw from this slide, is also decreased. So that's what explains this graph. It's the history behind the programs and how they were originally formed. And looking at these inflation adjusted numbers, this is showing what it all means to an arthroplasty surgeon a rapid decline in total physician payments. By the way, the 2023 numbers, as we said earlier, are a little bit lower at approximately $1,200, but that's in 2023 dollars, not in 2018 dollars, which is what this graph is. So anyone that has been doing arthroplasty in uh, 1990 knows that it wasn't $3,000. These are inflation adjusted. As a result, can a practice even be sustained on a Medicare-only model? After adjusting for practice, practice expenses, this article estimates a physician salary of $287,000. While I realize that is still a very large salary, if you take into account the increases in medical school debt, the opportunity cost for training in 10 years, this is a proposition that no financial advisor would recommend. But Medicare represents 66 million people. This is the data from March of this past year. That's 20% of the population. It covers 93% of Americans with insurance above the age of 63. Is dropping Medicare really tenable, especially given the average age of an arthroplasty patient is 59? Probably not. So we already heard about this uh, payment reform. This legislation would provide a relief from these cuts. This was introduced by physician advocates uh, in Congress. Um, and it would tie the annual Medicare physician payment to the Medicare economic index. Again, escaping the legislative process and moving us to the regulatory side of things. And I'm hopeful because everyone's on board. Every single subspecialty society, every single, uh, you know, anyone that's involved in medicine is involved with this because these payments also affect therapists, nurse practitioners, psychologists. When we were at the meetings last week, the, the Congress people said, oh yeah, we heard the dermatologist talking about this last week. Oh, we heard this person. So everyone is hitting them. It's a coordinated effort from the AMA. Even Medicare's own advisory panel felt that these cuts weren't sustainable and they recommended some type of inflation adjustment. They recommended 50%, but obviously we would prefer 100% and also to escape this whole legislative process completely. The real future challenge, though, is could this all be a repeat of 1988? This might be our 1988 moment, especially as we transition to value-based models, alternative payment plans, uh, value-based care. If we don't keep an eye on these things, if we don't keep our sort of involvement, uh, then it could be 1988 all over again. And while 1988 worked out relatively well for an orthopedic surgeon, right now, looking at the costs, it might not unless we stay actively involved. So, how do you get involved? Email campaigns, society memberships, PACs, talk to your member of Congress or society committees. The easiest way are these email campaigns. You sign up, you get an email, and then just click through the motions. Uh, AMA does this, AOS does this, AUKUS does this. Um, you can think about being a society member. I know we all like might have our disagreements with the AMA, but if you look at the numbers, numbers count. And this is just relative to AMA, AOS, and AUKUS. 
Um, they are leading the charge in this inflation adjustment, so it's something to think about. Consider giving to the PAC. It gives, it gives to both Republicans and Democrats. For anyone who's a trainee potentially in the room, you can get to a uh, Capital Club member pretty quickly, which means you get to go to all these fun networking events. I wish I had known this when I was a resident. About $100 would have introduced me to all these great people in the room and you know, really sort of jumpstart your career, so that's something else to think about. Meet with your Congress member if you can, and obviously be involved in your societies. This is a little plug for how I got involved with this with the AUKUS Healthcare Policy Fellowship. It was a great experience for me. And also there's all the websites from the AMA, AOS, and AUKUS. So I hope in conclusion, um, thanks for your time. I hope that I'm part the importance of physician advocacy, how we all need to stay involved. We can make a difference. There are many issues on the horizon for the future of medicine and for orthopedic surgery. We are the experts in the field, and nobody knows the needs of our patients better than us. Thank you. Thanks, Eli. Um, I know this is an important topic, and the course chair gave me a green light to just give five minutes of discussion. So if people can come up and if you have any questions, but I'll start off by uh, asking Hutch. So the proms, um, it's a huge administrative cost to the physician practices. Is there any talk about uh, being able to reimburse the doctors in regards to collection of these proms because it's a, quite an expensive undertaking. Where are we with that situation? Yeah, so that's a great question. And um, what we've come up with on the work group, we've been working for about a year now, is uh, we're in complete agreement that uh, we're not going to be able to move the needle much unless we can uh, show that we can actually get paid for this. Um, and so... Uh, our first thing that we looked at was the remote therapeutic monitoring uh, codes, and uh, we don't think that those are going to work for these. One is an issue of whether they'll be paid in the global period or not, which is probably no. And then the other one is is the, the codes are actually, uh, there's re remote therapeutic monitoring and remote patient monitoring. and. Um, I forget which one is which, but uh, the one that's more applicable potentially to collection and utilization of PROMS uh, requires uh, 16 documented uh, encounters where you actually looked at the data and did something with it. So that, that's not going to work for PROMS. So where we think that it will actually, poten or I shouldn't say actually, but potentially be able to be reimbursed is in, in the medical decision making part of your e &M code, which will hopefully allow you to upcode. And with regards to that, Hutch, why is Medicare so fixated on PROMS? I mean, there's a lot of uh, data that supports the actions that we take in regards to hip and knee replacements, quality of life improvements. Why are they focused on, on PROMS when there are other secondary uh, ways to evaluate the quality that the surgeons are providing, infection rates, readmission rates, ER visits? Mm -hmm. Why PROMS? Yeah, so uh, their argument is that w we've known about readmission rates and complication rates for a long time. Um, but uh, probably what is most important in, in terms of driving the value equation is what does the actual patient uh, think? And they view this as a you know pretty easy thing to do. Tell them to fill out a seven-question survey uh, and a 10-question survey before they have the operation and afterwards. That shouldn't be too big of a burden, and it will provide invaluable uh, data uh, that will be applicable really to all of the stakeholders. So that, that's why they're fixated on it, and it's definitely here to stay. Derek, if you had to pick the top three tools that you would choose for your practice, what would those be? Yeah, so um, it would be a patient reported outcome measure digital tool that that collects patient reported outcome measures. Again, one that is integrated with with um, you know with both your EMR and other tools. I think the second would actually be a patient engagement platform. These are a little bit of a double-edged sword because they can add work. Um, for your staff, and so we've had to sort of go back and forth about kind of how much uh, how much sort of leeway we give the patient engagement platform with our staff, but patients tend to love it, and that can actually then that's sort of the thing that the patient will interact with the most that if it's connected to can help you collect your patient reported outcome measures and then also help generate positive reviews from uh, from survey websites. Um, you know, and I think the I think the last one. Uh, you know, it's uh, uh, is um, uh, is probably that uh, an in-house tool that that UCSF decided to develop to deal with the patient ratings and review website issues. So this sort of goes back to a, a 
you know, the question of large healthcare systems and what digital tools they're going to work with, um, UCSF decided that because they couldn't affect the patient reviewed and review websites very much and the data was really inaccurate and there were all these legal challenges that they would actually have a review website that was internal that would then help us sort of help the physicians you know, with their own reviews and concomitant to that was a way to keep some patient equity in there. So there's actually, I, I'm on this committee. So there's actually a committee that reviews all the comments that go onto the website and negative comments can go up as long as they are not, you know, libelous and defamatory and discussing accurate medical information and that kind of stuff. So a physician can actually ask for a patient to, uh, comment to be taken down. Then there's a committee that votes on it. That committee includes patient advocates and that kind of stuff. So different kind of digital tool, but that was the third one. And, and let me guess, there's no screening for the mental health of the patient that factors into that committee's decision? <laughs> Unfortunately not. All right, and to Eli, so I'm noticing a trend, um, and I, I can't speak to other regions of the country, where surgeons who are more senior are now out, opting out of Medicare. Um, it's not a, uh, and it's it's interesting because the the charges are about equivalent to probably two iPhones now, uh, which is not very much, but it's it's more than zero, which with it to Medicare. Where is, uh, with advocacy that you guys are doing, have, has the limitations of access because of physicians not being able to have a sustained uh, ability to take care of these Medicare patients come up? And, and where is that going? Uh, given that I'm in Manhattan, uh, well, I'm in New York City, so I'm an employed model. Um, we take everyone, whether they're, they have no insurance, um, we take care of all the patients. But definitely, if you're in a private practice model, I understand where that's coming from. Uh, I understand that you have a limited amount of staff, and you're going to just get overwhelmed with the amount of volume that you're going to see. And I, I think that study uh, look from uh, NYU, looking at physician salary and costs, there's real problems that we're facing, and if there's a continued decline in reimbursements, then you're gonna see more consolidation in the healthcare market. You're gonna see more private practices closing because they can't maintain their costs. So I think that it's a choice that every doctor is gonna have to make, uh, and it's not healthy. It's not good for our general state of our healthcare system. And I think it also shifts the burden onto uh, large health centers where they're gonna have to take, pick up more of the slack now, which I think is, is not great for patient care in general. I think it might be on already. Okay. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, a question about what do you anticipate uh, CMS doing with the data eventually uh, with PROMS data? So right now, there's a penalty if they aren't collected. But at some point, are providers, healthcare systems going to be evaluated and paid based on those results? Um, you ready? <laughs> so it's coming. Uh, so I sit on a work group uh, for uh, the Yale uh, core group, which advises CMS on hip and knee replacement. Kevin Bozik's on it, Mary O'Connor, Jay Lieberman. Um, and uh, we have been slowing this process down for years. Uh, we can only slow it down for so long. So uh, there's no question that uh, there will uh, be penalties in the future for uh, patients who failure to meet uh, however you want to define the minimal clinically important uh, difference improvement, which isn't that high of a bar, uh, but it is definitely coming. They have not announced the timeline yet, but it is uh, going to be here within the next five years for sure. All right, well, thank you very much. I want to turn it over to one more question, Keith. There we go. Well, just a quick one uh, for Derek. Nice talk. Um, with some of these digital technologies, I mean, obviously you're at a major medical institution that can kind of shoulder some of the costs and development of this. I mean, those of us in private practice, who's going to pay for this eventually? I mean, because many of these companies, you know, put that onus on the practice and the surgeons, which doesn't make it very attractive, even if it does work. Um, you know, are the payers going to eventually get on board with paying for this? You know, we have to employ FTEs to run some of these right. apps or patient engagement platforms. You know, how, how are we going to pay? Yeah, it's, it's a really important question. And, and just because the medical center is shouldering a bunch of burden for this doesn't mean that it's still like a negative, you know, it's, that affects us too. Because the medical center is like, hey, we're paying for all this stuff, and so we're going to pay you less. 
So um, I think one thing is that, you know, I, I, I doubt that payers um, or Medicare is going to shoulder much of the burden for this, with the exception of if the digital health tool can help you build differently, right? So let's say, for instance, with the, um, you know, with the practice management codes, if there's a digital health tool with a patient engagement platform that can automatically generate, like, a note for you to dump into a billing platform where you can, like, say, hey, we're engaging this patient, we're doing management and stuff, and all of a sudden you can bill, so that may be a way to offset that cost. Um, but the uh, unfortunately, a lot of these costs are going to be borne by the practices. Now there are some ways you can you can change that. So one you know one thing you can a couple things you can do. So one thing you can consider is you can partner with a a younger company and sort of co-develop a platform together, and you can sort of shoulder the cost together and exchange, and the deal is for in exchange for you helping them with your patient's data and helping them figure out what their platform really does and all that kind of stuff, then you can actually maybe get the platform to, to sort of you know partner with you and shoulder the costs. So in some scenarios, you can develop something in-house that's sort of a temporary fix or a temporary thing that can act long-term. So, you know, a surgery scheduling platform, if, you, if you're able to sort of pay a a, you know, a, a company to come in, just develop sort of a one-time thing for you that sort of works in the long term. That might be a, short, uh, a smaller cost. Um, but unfortunately, the, these digital health tools are really kind of unfunded. And so it really depends on the practice as to whether or not, and again, that kind of goes back to the framework as to, is this digital health tool going to help our practice financially? And if the, either primarily or secondarily, and if the answer to that is no, then then you should be cautious about adopting it, right? You know, if you really don't think that an online practice reputation tool is worthwhile for you because your practice already has a good reputation and you don't really care that much about the person who complains about, like, your parking structure and that kind of stuff, then don't buy it, you know? Um, and then also don't, you know, really be careful about buying the things that work, right? So you don't want to sign up for a digital AI scribe program that turns out to not actually be that great. And then the, you know, the little device that they sold you sits in the corner collecting dust for the next five or six years, ask us how we know. Um, so, you know, you just really want to be careful when adopting these digital tools. Let the company shoulder what burden they can for you in terms of code development. But the other side is whatever ho hospitals you partner with, ask them to shoulder some of the burden, right? So we were talking last night about sort of the hospital partnerships. If you go to a hospital partnership and say, hey, you know, we really need to, to together collect patient reported outcome measures, you guys got to help us pay for this tool, you know, and this is why you're going to lose money. That's a pretty strong argument. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll move on to the next session. Dr. Hansen.